all. And, and thank you very much for joining us in this session of the CIC National Capital Branch entitled Assessing Canada's Women, Peace and Security Agenda. My name is Elizabeth Kingston and I'm the president of this branch of the CIC. And this is one of 17 branches across the country. We're delighted to collaborate this evening with the Women's Peace and Security Network under the able leadership of Beth Warnerick and are most thankful for the ongoing support we've received from the International Development Research Center as it celebrates its 50th anniversary. Thank you both for your kind support and collaboration with the CIC. It's very much appreciated. This evening, we are looking into Canada's second five-year national action plan on women, peace and security, now halfway through its implementation period. We look to the progress made, the challenges ahead, all the while looking to assess the priorities for the next few years, both within the Canadian context and throughout the world. It has been proven many, many times that the best predictor of a state's peacefulness is how its women are treated. To lead this important discussion, we are delighted to have with us this evening, Ambassador Jacqueline O'Neill, Canada's first ambassador for women, peace and security. Ambassador O'Neill is joined by Colleen Duggan, the senior strategist at IDRC, Beth Warnerick, the policy lead at the Equality Fund, and Waz Mafro, a peace building expert from Afghanistan. Zoe Dugal, our moderator, is a board member of the CIC National Capital Branch and Deputy Director at Canadem. You will find their bios on the CIC website, and we thank you all very much for attending this evening. It's a real pleasure to be able to host such an important discussion. All on the panel have worked tirelessly over many years on issues related to human rights, gender, and transitional justice and peace building, and the rich discussion this evening will reflect the breadth of their remarkable work and ongoing commitment to further the uh, agenda for women's peace and security, both within Canada and internationally. So thank you all very much. And Zoe, over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, bienvenue à tous, à nos participants et à nos panelists. Um, we are very happy to have all these great uh, panelists tonight. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, they have many, many years of international and Canadian experience um, on the topic that we are discussing tonight. Um, so I want to welcome everyone. Um, this seminar um, is going to be in English, but if you would like to ask questions in French, you can do that and I will translate them for our panelists. So the way it will work is that we're going to ask each panelist to make some opening remarks for three to five minutes each, after which I will have some questions for them. Um, we will do one round of questions and see how far this takes us, and then uh, possibly a second round, and then we will go to questions from you, the audience. And so you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and type your question. The chat function will be disabled because we have uh, this seminar for a short time and we want to focus on what the panelists have to say and uh, questions also from all of you. Um, other than that, um, yes, those are my technical um, remarks. And so uh, with no further ado, I would like to start um, the actual substantive part of the seminar, um, I will ask Ambassador Jackie to start with her opening remarks, and then uh, we will go to the next panelist. So, Jackie. All right. Am I off mute? Yes. Thanks, Zoe. And thanks, uh, Elizabeth, for kicking us off. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. It's really great to be with the CIC community. Uh, just before I got this position about a year and a half ago, I was based in Washington, D.C., but I was on the CIC National Board. Uh, and so many of these events were such a great way to stay connected to, to home, <laughs> to, to be back home. And unfortunately, the ethics commissioner advised me that I had to resign the position when I started so that uh, we could all be above board. Uh, but I was very disappointed to do so. And I'm really extra glad to be back with this community today. And I will move quickly because the real treat here is going to be for you all to listen to the other panelists, Beth and Colleen, who have really 
without exaggeration, put this issue on the map in Canada and, and worked tirelessly to keep it on the map. And Washma, who has taught me in what, I think the last maybe 10 years or so that I've known you really how to speak truth to power. And I mean, very hard truths like describing the ineffectiveness of trillion dollar government strategies and military strategies. And I mean, real power. And she has said to, you know, the Speaker of the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Chair of the U U.S. Joint Chiefs, the highest level of the Afghan government, the Taliban, uh, it's a treat. So I will get going so you can hear from them. And I wanted to start really briefly because with, with a word on what is women, peace and security. And I know we're gonna get into the, the details, but I find that as much as uh, people know about women, peace and security and talk about it in the National Action Plan, there's still a lot of misconceptions about what it is. And I think it's really core to communicate that we're talking about an idea that at its core, is about the idea that the best policies and practices result when the people who are most directly affected by them have a voice in shaping them. And recognizing that women are dramatically underrepresented in decisions about peace and security. And I wanna be clear, it's really not about saying that women are inherently more peaceful than men or that all women are the same, they're sort of interchangeable and any woman inserted at any point will do. It's really about understanding that we have different intersecting identities and those voices are all important. That women have a right to be included, that we have better decisions that result when they do. And as we know from every other field, diverse groups make better decisions. So I just wanna convey that and, and dispel sometimes the myths that, that some of us still face. And the other thing I wanna emphasize is that, you know, this is an area that there, where there has been at least stated support from across the political spectrum. So our implementation of our agenda in, in Canada is guided by a national action plan, as you mentioned, Elizabeth and, uh, and Zoe. And we're now halfway through our second one. The first one was introduced under a conservative government, the second one now under the current government. Uh, and I state that to emphasize that this is something that has had support for quite some time. Uh, and that we, I think it, in my position, I, I like to make that point very strongly that this is something that has sustained attention over many years. So not only has the world uh, changed since we first launched our national action plan in 2010, uh, but a lot since 2017 under this current one. And I, I hope to think that we've uh, learned some things along the way. And I'll speak to those maybe in the next round. And I thought what I could do just to kick it off is do a bit of framing and, and scene setting of what we're engaging with internationally. So, you know, 2020 was supposed to have been a big year for women, peace and security. It's 20 years since the first Security Council resolution, 1325, uh, 25 years since the Beijing Declaration, 75 years since the creation of the UN. Uh, and it was meant to be a year both of reflection, uh, celebration and looking ahead. And then there was this pandemic that really disrupted things, but also made the, the need and the importance of this issue a whole lot more stark. So in this year of reflection, I think we've seen a lot of progress at this normative level. We've got 10 resolutions from the Security Council. We have 90 countries with 91, I think now, with the National Action Plan. We have a real research base on women's participation. And we've made progress in, in some key areas globally. But this year, there has been just resounding consensus that we are still not seeing the changes we need in terms of implementation. You know, Afghan women, Washmo will tell us about Yemeni women, women around the world are still fighting for direct representation in peace talks, for example. And, you know, even before the pandemic, it was clear that there were major gaps. There were gaps in terms of our investment in prevention in participation in peace negotiations themselves. There's been very little accountability, especially for justice of uh, survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. And women peace builders are still dramatically underfunded. And then you add the pandemic, which was, has exacerbated what was already afoot. So we're seeing far more authoritarianism. A lot of examples of kind of strongman governments that are exploiting the pandemic. Uh, to crack down on organizing and mobilizing and freedom of speech and stepping up digital surveillance. We're seeing more populism, more nationalism, uh, regression of women's rights globally and a backlash to gender equality, more kidnappings, harassment, assassination of women, human rights defenders. We're seeing this so-called uh, 
gender ideology becoming more and more of a dominant idea. We can talk more about what that is. And we're seeing uh, Russia and some others, including to some degree China, really trying to undermine a lot of our normative frameworks and arguing wrongly, and I want to emphasize wrongly, that this concept is a Western notion and, and is imposed from the outside. Even the rise of China is a real dynamic uh, that we're, we're having to engage uh, in and with, given that China has a very strong aversion to forms of external support that are conditioned on democratic governance and on human rights enforcement. And both of these have been really strong entry points for women, peace and security access. So I haven't even talked yet about climate change and cybersecurity and a whole range of other issues, all which have really deep linkages to women, peace and security. But I wanted to frame this international context as one in which uh, Canada is trying to work and to advocate. And as I mentioned, happy to come back and speak more about what we're doing uh, within Canada to respond to that. But I'll stop here for now. Thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for those opening remarks. I'm sure we will have many questions on a lot of the topics you've covered briefly. So we'll have a chance to dig a little bit deeper uh, during the discussion, hopefully. Um, can I ask Beth to go next, please? Thanks, Zoe, and thank you very much to the CIC for coordinating this, this panel. It's a real delight to um, have the honor to, to share the, the stage with these other speakers and to explore these, these issues with you. Um, I'd like to talk very briefly about um, some of the things that uh, I think Canada is doing well on women, peace and security, and some of the, the areas where perhaps more attention, better attention could be devoted. And I really appreciate the framing that the ambassador started with globally. I think this global context is really, really important because as she was saying, one of the major themes that came out of the 10 year anniversary discussions last fall was that we really do have an implementation gap. We have a lot of rhetoric, we have a lot of work in the normative framework, but we're hearing from uh, women working in various contexts. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Wasma that things aren't changing, that all this time has gone by and we're still facing the same problems that we've um, that we were facing before. And I think that this is really, really important for Canada and it helps to define or it helps to put the challenge of what it means to be a leader in this in this context, because it is a difficult environment. And on this, I do think that there are many things that Canada is doing well, that, that the government is is moving ahead. Um, of course, there are also areas where the work could be better, the work could be better, um, could be sharper, and, and I'll, I'll uh, ho hope to outline a few, a, a few points there. So first off, though, what's, where, where are some of the uh, points that where we can applaud? Well, one is that there is um, a strong whole of government approach to women, peace and security here in Canada. The National Action Plan has seven ministers signing it. Um, this is different from the plans in a lot of other countries where it's just the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or, or, or even in some cases the Gender Equality Ministry. So I think that this strong political support is really important and an acknowledgement of the whole breadth and depth of women, peace and security issues. We often use women, peace and security as a shorthand and those of us um, sometimes working in this bubble uh, forget that, that it, there really is a whole range of of issues that this agenda uh, encompasses. So it's really good in Canada that we have immigration, refugee and citizenship Canada signing on to the national action plan to explore what are some of the, the, the issues around refugees and migrations and how a women, peace and security lens helps us move these forward. Um, I think there's also um, a really, uh, you can see an evolution in the language in the National Action Plan from the previous one to, to this one. There is a real attempt in this National Action Plan to, to acknowledge and recognize the links between a gender perspective, women's security and overall security. Just as the ambassador was saying, this is something where we've, we've come a long way from this being a special niche area that some people should look at versus this growing awareness that actually 
um, this perspective, a gender perspective or gender analysis really does help us understand a lot of complex security issues. So we've gone from um, an attitude that we heard maybe 15 years ago, people saying, well, I can either work on gender equality or I can work on women's rights or I can work on peace. And what's happened in this national action plan and, and a lot of the way Canada now approaches the issues is to say that dichotomy is totally false, that actually it's, it's, they converge and a stronger understanding of the gender dynamics of security or of different situations will actually help you be more effective at building peace. Um, the third point where I think Canada is doing well, and maybe we can even talk about this a bit later, is in the National Action Plan, there is a recognition of the role of civil society, both in terms of contributions to peace around the world, so pointing out the, the, the absolute crucial role played by women's organization, and we're, and, and we're going to hear from, from Washma on that. So that this, is, this is not just um, the role of, of states, to address these issues, but there are important insights, lessons, and women's organizations as drivers of peace. And in the National Action Plan, that's reflected in a formalization of the relationship between our network, the Women, Peace, and Security Network, and um, Global Affairs Canada in a, in a Women, Peace, and Security Advisory Group that's co-chaired and that we um, we meet at least twice, twice a year. So that's a really, uh, positive uh, advancement in this in this uh, um, action plan, and probably over over time, I should have maybe started with what we're doing wrong, so I so I know this. But but real quickly, some of the then where where Canada could do could do better. Um, one of the big areas that where the the work has been criticized is that there's not enough focus on conflict prevention, not enough attention to issues related to disarmament. After all, it's called the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Agenda. A lot of the, 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 the push from women's organizations have been peace activists. So there are criticisms, for example, of the coherence of having a women, peace and security um, focus or priority, but still sell arms to Saudi Arabia or the lack of discussion on the imbalance between our military spending, our defense spending and our development assistance budgets. Um, I think a second um, challenge has been the failure to address the misogynist and um, toxic environment within the Canadian Armed Forces and we're seeing that erupt in the headlines the last two months so we can also talk about that but we've known about these problems for for a number of years um, the su former Supreme Court Justice Marie Deschamps or her report came out in 2015 that noted um, the situation and made recommendations and she recently testified that many of the recommendations in her report were gathering dust so that I think is an issue that um, uh, we can point to as a, as a weakness. And finally, I think the other um, issue is an inconsistent application across all of the government departments of what we mean by the, the uh, women, peace and security agenda. And maybe that's the flip side of, of doing a whole of government approach that then it's hard to develop consistent understanding and conceptual approaches. So I hear from people, oh, well, I don't understand how um, women, peace and security relates to a feminist foreign policy or how it relates to Canada's uh, gender based analysis plus that everyone is supposed to do within within the government departments. So there still is this, um, despite the, the efforts that are being made, there still is a failure to approach these issues co coherently and consistently across all areas. So those are those are a few quick reflections for me to kick us off. And I'm really excited to hear the other panelists. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, I think uh, the network is just also published uh, something on some of the topics that you've mentioned. So we will come back to some of these topics for sure and the questions. Um, can I ask Colin to go next, please? Thank you. Sure, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Always good to do a sound check. Um, thanks very much um, to uh, CIC for the invitation. Really happy to be here with such um, fantastic and, and dynamic women. Um, I would just sort of kick off um, reflecting, um, as Jacqueline did, that, uh, you know, last year we marked 
uh, 20 years of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Um, and during that time, um, a call was made for a new compact on women, peace, security, and humanitarian action. And so I think this is a very positive thing. And I think that it also um, reflects what Beth uh, referred to is that we are kind of moving away from this niche based approach to the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, I think things like um, the so-called triple nexus, uh, where we have a lot of work in an international aid to sort of trying to be bridging development, humanitarian and peace building assistance. Um, these are very um, positive developments. Um, but one thing I will say is that uh, over the years, um, as I have worked um, in this field, um, and I would say, uh, to the extent in which that I've actually been in the field, it's still incredibly frustrating to hear people when they're um, and when international actors are talking about gender based violence, they still often say, well, you know, is it conflict violence or is it just sort of common everyday violence? And I think that this is something that we really have to struggle with. And so I think that another really positive development has been move, this move towards framing this all under a wider understanding of security and what women's security is and what uh, security needs are. So I think that's just a first um, reflection that, uh, that I would make. Um, the second thing is I would also say um, that obviously coming from IDRC, um, which for those of you who don't know us, um, we are a Canadian Crown Corporation and we fund research for development uh, to advance knowledge um, around development problems in different parts of the world. Um, we focus increasingly um, on the issues of inequalities and climate change, especially now with the launch of our new 10-year strategy um, in February. What I would say around that is I think a really positive development for this agenda has been a much more evidence-based or evidence-focused approach to trying to push towards solutions and to underpin advocacy and activism. Um, the important lines that are included um, in this agenda. So that's uh, also really important. But one thing I would like to focus on today in terms of what I see a new emerging challenge and Jacqueline referred to it very briefly, but I would focus um, some of my introductory remarks around this is just really um, the challenge that we're facing around the role of technology and especially the prevention and protection from technology facilitated gender-based violence and what that should play in women, peace and security going forward. And I would even dare to call it WPS 2.0 because I think the influence and the dimensions around uh, technology facilitated gender-based violence are massive. And that's really been laid bare with COVID-19 um, and some of the hard hitting realities that we've seen around inequalities and growing insecurity for women and girls. Um, and it's really made us come to understand just how pervasive and all consuming technology has become in every aspects of our life and just how fast the world um, is changing. So I just to kind of move away a little bit from the jargon, when I talk about technology facilitated gender based violence, it's also been referred to as cyber violence or online abuse. And what we're really talking about is some of these manifestations that we see such as online harassment, gender trolling, um, even uh, we can extend it to uh, stealing people's identity, um, harassment of politicians, the targeting of women and girls who are actively pursuing um, political agendas, including um, uh, YPS. And I would say that um, an important piece of that we need to remember around this is that um, as Beth pointed out, YPS is an agenda which seeks to harness the commitment of states. And it, in that sense, it depends on states and civil society for its advancement. Um, but what we're really facing now, and I think the pandemic has really um, magnified this, is um, the porous nature of state borders and just um, and how technology and especially the internet 
um, can really lead to positive or negative experiences as shown in the pandemic, but really that it can be act as it can become a tool um, to either uh, push forward uh, WPS or to really uh, undermine uh, WPS. And unfortunately, we're seeing really, really negative impacts around the use of technology to undermine um, important political agendas, including WPS. And I think that one of the reasons that we should really care about this, and if we really think back to the way that um, rape and other forms of sexual and gender-based violence were talked about as weapons of war 20 years ago when we started this journey, we really need to think about um, how technology facilitated gender-based violence has the potential to wreak multiple forms of havoc and at really alarming levels. And I'm happy to go into that a little bit more when we go deeper into this. But I think an important piece to remember is, as I said, how porous technology is, how quickly it moves around the world, how quickly it moves harm and it moves conflict. And I think that we need to remember that the intents behind online, online gender-based violence are the same as other forms of gender-based violence. It's to subjugate, to humiliate, to victimize, and ultimately to control uh, the types of power that women and girls can wield. And I think the other thing that we need to think about is the difference, the key difference here is the speed and the ease with which this type of violence can be executed because technology has become such a central part of our lives. Any woman or group for that matter, LGBTQI people are incredibly targeted by uh, cyber violence. They can now be target targeted and victimized from an iPhone or from the comfort of anyone's living room. And so the gender harm that we can, that we're talking about now is really just clicks away. So I think it's, that's a really important part of the agenda that I'd like to see highlighted and built in and how we can kind of come out of that silo. There's a completely different group of people who work on this and how we can link it into some of the great networks and civil society organizations who are working on the WPS agenda. I'll leave it there for now. I probably went over too. Thank you so much, Colleen. I don't mind so much that anyone goes over because this is also interesting. Um, maybe this is a topic for the new, uh, the next uh, national action plan. So maybe we can discuss this later um, when we discuss what is, um, what is it that we would like to see in the future for Canada and, and women, peace and security agenda. So uh, Wasmar, can you please go with your opening remarks? Thank you so much. Um, I'm very much honored to, to be part of this discussion and particularly, uh, you know, at a time when it's a very important, it has always been important times around Afghanistan issues, at least in the past 20 years. But uh, as this political settlement is being, uh, you know, um, discussed or uh, uh, initiated between Afghan and the government and the Taliban, this is an important time for Afghans and Afghanistan in my country. Uh, but I want to start with, uh, you know, I, I'm just mourning the, the loss of three health workers today, earlier today in, in Nangrahar province and um, who were uh, killed while they were vaccinating kids. And tomorrow you will not have any other woman from the same province come up, coming up uh, to uh, show up for the vaccination. For a lot of people, you know, attacks on women, and, and of course this, this is added on the level of violence on women that we have seen in Afghanistan, for example, and I'm giving examples of Afghanistan in the past at least three years as, as the political settlement with the Taliban takes more pace. Uh, we have had more than 60 civil society activists and journalists being attacked. And for a lot of people um, within the international community, it's collateral damage. Oh, this is a war going on, you know, every men are being attacked, women are being attacked, kids are being attacked. But for many of us, um, you know, uh, peace activists who have studied this um, field for so many years, we know that this is not collateral damage anymore. Attacks on women is being used as a weapon of war right now. And um, there was a time when, uh, you know, these 
attacks could be collateral damage of the war, but at least in the past 20, 25 years, just the way national security has been framed globally, we, we do not, we see insurgents, you know, violent extremist groups, if it's the Al-Shabaab in Nigeria, for example, kidnapping the girls from school, the ISIS love jihad, or the Taliban attacks on women, all of this, there is one thing in common, and that's what the insurgents, the violent extremist groups have actually used attacks on women as a weapon of their war. In Afghanistan, even um, religious extremist groups, uh, they um, you know, manifest their existence by regulating women's covering, by regulating women's rights or women in public spaces. So uh, this is a new reality that we are dealing with, which I believe the international rhetoric around women, peace and security is still around gender equality, is still around women's rights, not around national security or global peace and security. And that's a big problem in my view, because while many of us, for example, I've been engaged in Afghanistan peace and negotiation for all these years, um, you know, at least past 10 years, but very closely in the past three, four years. And, uh, and uh, I was appointed by the president on the High Peace Council. And, and while I engaged with insurgents and, and people who have taken up arms, the way they look at women is much smarter than the way actually states look at women. They look at women as agents for bringing their fear, their terror into the communities. But states, or the governments or the international community look at women just like any other social group or maybe a very marginalized you know groups that are being you know suppressed and that's the biggest challenge that we are having with the international partners and the international community there is this understanding that okay if there is aid being provided to you know women organizations and women's rights maybe we are able to you know improve the inclusion of women but still we are not able, like uh, we had a Moscow conference on Afghanistan just two weeks back. Among 16 people, there was one woman, uh, you know, and that one woman was because we had made a lot of noise. And, uh, and, when, and so when we talked, you know, to the, um, a, a lot of our partners, you know, including, you know, um, governments, um, the, the Canadian embassy and other embassies in Kabul, for example, you know, their, uh, their response was that, oh, this was, you know, the invitation did not come for women. So it, women were not invited. So we, this is the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the world reality that, that we are living, uh, living with because while we, from a women's group's perspective, for us, uh, you know, women's uh, presence, women's engagement is actually being, is, is a, it, it, it's a tool of war as well as a tool of peace. Because then how, how do you actually initiate or bring peace to a community is through, you know, like um, creating community and conflict resolution, bringing, you know, if, if addressing the challenges of girls, access to schools, uh, create, creating clinics, creating jobs. So we look at it from a more community welfare, community security perspective. While, uh, you know, the response we have been getting um, all these years from our international pa partners and allies, that it is a women's rights, it's a, like a kind of an ad hoc, a ghetto, a ghetto kind of a challenge. And, and that's something that, you know, um, I think um, many of the national action plans um, globally are not able to address because when we do not bring in this core uh, reality that, you know, women's uh, status, conditions of women and how women are being attacked and targeted in the wars and conflict, if that is, is not considered a security issue and just merely, oh, it's culture. And it's so, you know, interesting, we had an, a call um, with some of our international partners just the day before yesterday. And somebody said, you know, in your culture, women are already being suppressed. So why are you worried about the Taliban deal? 
yeah, well, it's a cruel kind of look at it, but it's it, it's the way people are are thinking about it. They think, you know, women's attitudes and uh, attitude towards women is a very cultural issue. So why are we worried about if you have a Taliban government or if you have another kind of a government? What is what difference does it make? But then I explained to her that you know what it makes a whole world difference because when you have a government that regulates the kind of you know that a woman cannot get out of home that a woman cannot go to school that a woman cannot be able to be a polio worker a health worker a teacher or or cannot be a president for example or cannot run for office or if her face is is visible all of these uh, you know uh, challenges are actually would take the society back to so many uh, you know, uh, uh, back to where we had started. And at the same time, I also laid out the, the fact that, you know, militarization also brings civil war. There are so many different ethnic issues, for example, social realities in a society that actually it can, you know, uh, that it can actually exacerbate a civil war. So while we as women are engaging in the national um, uh, peace processes, it's not about women's inclusion. It's actually about creating that uh, uh, process successful. And that's what we have failed to uh, integrate into the global discussions. I've been part of the Afghanistan National Action Plan development during 2015 and, and, and 2017. And, and that has been, you know, of course, the budgets, the challenges uh, uh, was there. And, and engagement with all the uh, countries, you know, including Canada has been that, oh, we are allocating this much money for, for, for you know, aid. But that's not enough. We need, you know, a very robust political engagement to bring in women as part of the politics. And, and this new reality that insurgents use women in treatment of women as a weapon of war needs to be clearly a, as a global security issue. And I think that that's where I want to end here and, and address any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wazma. Um... You know, I, maybe I will start with you actually with a question so we can stay on the topic of Afghanistan. Um, you know, you mentioned it, um, this incident this morning um, with the three health workers being assassinated. There's been a number of assassination of prominent women in the last few weeks and months in Afghanistan, including a high court judge, judge um, a number of journalists, including TV presenters, all women. So I was wondering if you see um, what is the link between this and the actual peace negotiations that are ongoing between the governments and the Taliban? Um, and whether you think this is, um, let's say, as you were describing this use of violence against women as a weapon of war, and what do you think it means for the future of the peace process and, and, and the government in Afghanistan? Uh, yes, so a lot of uh, women have been attacked in the past few years, you know, when I talk to our um, other uh, defenders, you know, either they have left the country or they have actually went into hiding. So it's very, very you know, difficult for a lot of women activists and, and peace activists in Afghanistan. And the reason we related together with the political settlement, with the peace talks with the Taliban is because Women's rights in the situation of women in Afghanistan has always been as a symbol or as a determinant of the situation. When people talk about, you know, good days, they talk about girls' education. They talk about women going to clinics. They talk about women becoming politicians. And when they talk about bad days of the country, then they, they actually, they use these uh, current attacks and saying how the situation has worsened. So women have, in Afghanistan, um, and my experience is that women have become that determinant of, uh, you know, of the situation. Um, and that is also very political, like uh, women are being used as a political, you know, tool in this, in the, on both sides. You know, when the Taliban um, enter into the negotiations, you know, the first thing they start talking about is that the Islamic Emirate has to start, you know, regulating the rights of women. And that was, you know, one of the very first, uh, you know, um, issues that came up from them. So we related very much with the peace process. And um, we think that a lot of the Taliban groups who are, uh, you know, part of the insurgency, they are attacking these women. 
and they are attacking these women because of the, the creating this culture of fear and also because the Taliban are fighting in two levels. One is that they are you know, fighting on the table, um, on the negotiation, but they also, because they are only weapon of um, you know, violence, violence is their only weapon in the society because they don't have any constituencies in the society. Like you almost would hardly find anybody in the society who would actually agree that you know, the Taliban way of life is, is the correct one. So they don't have any constituencies they are against elections, they are against women's rights, they are against media, they are against, you know, televisions, anything, music. So uh, for them, you know, a lot of the, this is, is part of the peace uh, negotiations. And, uh, and they are also trying to create this, this image that, you know, we are winning on the battlefield. Because as much as attacks on women happen, there is more culture of fear. As I said earlier, that in the same province, tomorrow no other woman would go out for us to, to be a vaccinator. And imagine how much a big news is that that is. So that is what is earning them, you know, that negative publicity, but of course it's, it's important for them. And that's how they continue perpetuating that they are winning on the battlefield. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Wazma, for this perspective. I think this is uh, really crucial and we will have to see. I think a lot of Canadians are watching closely the peace negotiations in Afghanistan because, you know, as you know, Canada has been involved for good or for bad <laughs> with Afghanistan for many years. And so this is really a topic that is is been prominent uh, in Canada. Um, I would like to move a little bit to Ambassador Jackie, maybe for a question. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned in her opening remarks, um, this current uh, national action plan for Canada is the second one. Um, we do have, um, it, it's going to end in 2022, which is end of next year. So this is really close uh, in terms of time, especially uh, with this pandemic ongoing and, and everything being complicated in terms of consultations, etc. cetera. Um, I was wondering if you had any perspective on how the implementation has been so far and what you see as the next uh, challenges, let's say, to be included in the next CNAP. As you are the first um, women peace and security ambassador for Canada, so this is a position that was created uh, two and a half years ago and you were the first ambassador. So it would be great to have your perspective on this, sitting at the, let's say, the nexus of all these government departments that are part of the CNAP and are trying to coordinate uh, their implementation. Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, Beth also gave a really strong analysis. I don't want to you know, repeat some of what she said, which I really strongly agree with. Um, so I, I will talk about what's next. And if I can, I want to respond really briefly to just the other speakers first, because it will inform the, the next steps part. Um, and, you know, on Colleen's point about uh, technology, and, and uh, I just, you know, couldn't agree more about the importance of it. And, and one of the challenges I think that we're all facing is doing what Beth was talking about is making the case and actually what Washman was just talking about making the case that it is being used to um, perpetuate power or to secure power or the dimensions that underlie the use of anything, either women as weapons of war, technology, those are underlying societal and, and community dynamics and people will use whatever tools they can um, to advance that. And so we're trying increasingly to make the case, for example, that everything related to cybersecurity um, has a gender dimension. And, and for example, we've been talking recently about even privacy, data privacy. Some people think, well, that's just a, you know, it affects men, women, people of uh, non-gender um, non conforming people equally. But, you know, we've, you unpack that further, you know, sexual minorities, for example, if their health records are released in certain countries, they can face prosecution or they can face death. You know, women who've accessed reproductive health services, and th those records themselves can be weaponized. Uh, even as you mentioned, you know, research targeted at, at women and women politicians, activists, human rights defenders, that's much more likely to go from being online only to being physical. And so, there's, there's so much to unpack in that and something that people see as as neutral as technology just is, is completely um, completely needs this attention. And, and one thing that I'm very proud of is that Canada in the last year has launched what they call a Women in Cyber Fellowship Program to try to get more women and more young women in particular engaged in multilateral negotiations around cybersecurity so that we have women from Global South, women 
uh, from diverse backgrounds talking about gender perspectives uh, on cyber. And then Wajma, I totally, totally agree and always love your points about the way that, you know, insurgent groups, violent extremism or violent extremists think about women. And this is a point that I know Beth and I make often um, is that, you know, we sometimes it's still viewed as a niche issue or thinking about women as something to do once you've done the core analysis of security. But if you think about who is really using gender, who's doing a gender-based analysis plus, not for, not for good and not calling it by the, the terminology or the jargon that we use, it's often violent extremist groups or other groups who are trying to misuse power. And so, you know, as Beth talked about at the beginning, we have to really get to the core element of what is power in societies and community? What do we mean by security? And that, and other groups are getting this and we need to keep getting it further and further into our core parts. I promise that we'll get to your question about what's next then. Um, so, and I'll do it really briefly, even though it's a very big question. Uh, some, some obvious ones, uh, one relates to the element that Beth talked about uh, related to domestic participation and, and, and self-identification uh, uh, of women, peace and security priorities. So as, as Beth mentioned, it's fairly uncommon for countries to have, countries like Canada in particular, to have both an international and domestic focus. So I really am looking forward to seeing more domestic focus and more consistent uh, application and integration across other departments and importantly, we have Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs and Indigenous Services Canada as partners, and really recognizing that you know, First Nations, Métis and Inuit women in Canada, just they live at this nexus, at this intersection of colonialism and racism and sexism. And elements and, and principles of women, peace, and security are ones that the entire government and all Canadians need to be listening to as we address reconciliation and work to change ongoing. Uh, problems. And, and I think that's a really a strong element, including implementing the missing and murdered indi Indigenous women and girls. Uh, you know, there are 231 calls for justice. Many of them really are exactly what you'd see in a national action plan on women's security. Love to focus much more on young people and youth engagement uh, in our national action plan, uh, more really deliberately intersectional, uh, you know, naming the naming and the importance of intersectionality in this field, uh, more specificity, I'd say, on, on gaps where there hasn't been as robust uh, either reference or, or strategy, including disarmament, climate change, a range of other elements. Um, and then, you know, many others, so don't, don't take that as a finite list. Uh, but I, I just want to end by saying, you know, there, there are two really powerful dynamics that we saw, we have seen over the last year. There's the pandemic and everything we've seen and are learning as a result of it. And then there's an increasingly global movement and attention to systemic racism and much more recognition that we have systemic racism in our institutions. And I think together we can hopefully see some windows of, of disruption to have some major takeaways. One of those is the, as Colleen was referencing, a really expanded definition of security. So recognizing that the hardware of traditional security is not all that anyone needs to feel secure. We have multiple different needs, including functioning health systems and police forces that are well-trained and representative that make us secure. Another big thing that I think the two of them coming together have really highlighted is the importance of disaggregated data. So we're seeing you know, the word disaggregated data on the front page of national newspapers before when we talk about the ways that the pandemic, for example, is impacting different groups differently and how various racialized communities have very um, much more pronounced negative impacts, for example. So even just understanding the importance of segregating our policies and data, I think is a window that we can get much more um, grounded in. And then lastly, and, and this is something that we're always trying to, to strengthen, but is valuing local knowledge. You know, in the pandemic track is, is Washman knows very well, many women peace and security uh, activists and many um, de human rights defenders and others in communities had to pivot to be frontline service providers and do things like delivering vaccines, talking about vaccine acceptance and, and countering misinformation, doing all kinds of things that were really crucial to their communities. And that was at a time, especially at the beginning, when major multilaterals and major organizations didn't have the ag agility to deliver services. And they weren't doing it in a way that was customized to be effective. So hopefully uh, these 
two kind of dynamics coming together are really going to reinforce the value of local knowledge and, and local communities defining and being engaged in solutions. Again, there's much more than that, but I'll stop talking because you're all looking at me like I'm going over time. No, no, thank you so much, Ambassador. This is great. Um, I think that, you know, there will be a lot of topics that um, will have to come into the next um, National Action Plan. I think, as you mentioned, for sure, um, the, the world has changed a little bit, even in the last three years, um, for good and for bad. Um, so I think there's a lot of topics that um, will have to, to be included that are not necessarily fully spelled out in the current action plan. I'm glad that you mentioned um, the inclusion of Cyrenaic and Indigenous Services Canada and violence against um, Indigenous women. I think this is a big topic that um, I wanted to ask about this actually, so I'm glad that you covered that topic. So I have one last question to ask. And um, I would like to just follow up very quickly maybe on, on what you were saying and ask Colleen to, to talk a little bit more about this aspect of the importance of research in terms of um, gender-based violence and violence against women in the technology, but also in terms of this uh, building up of local knowledge. I know IDRC is working with a lot of um, local actors in many countries to, to, to gain this uh, access to local knowledge and data. And what is the importance of this in, in to the uh, women, peace and security agenda? Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, um, Zoe. Yeah, it's um, and thanks so much, uh, Jackie, also for for mentioning the importance of local knowledge. Um, it is so important, and I think that some of the um, Wasma made some really important observations just around. And this has been a, a little bit the experience of IDRC um, over the last five years. We've supported quite a bit of research on. Um, gendered perspectives around uh, violent extremism and women's participation in violent extremist uh, movements. And what we really find is that, um, uh, yes, it's gendered, but also the motivations really differ um, according to context um, and according to whether or not women willingly enter into these movements or whether or not they're coerced into these movements. Sometimes it's almost one and the same. You know, if you're living in conditions of absolute abject poverty, it's not like you have a lot of choices. Um, or if your family is being held hostage. So, you know, really trying to get a handle on local knowledge um, is an important piece of this because it really is going to help shape any kind of policies or programs or any kind of um, solutions that we can sort of try to put forward uh, yeah, in future. And that's really been our experience um, in places, um, different places in West Africa. Um, and in Tunisia, for example, where some of the researchers that we funded actually were able, were quite successful in inputting into, um, into uh, a government law around defining terrorism and violent extremism and actually being able to put a gendered lens on it. So um, very important. I wanted to just come back to um, really, I think one of the things that uh, we do need, I mean, I know it's very typical for researchers to say we need more research, but we actually really do need more research around some of these things. Um, it, you know, going back to um, the issue of um, online uh, violence, um, we were actually quite surprised in IDRC in, 20, in 2019 when we started to look into this more deeply. We realized that most of the research out there on cybersecurity and online gender-based violence um, has been undertaken in North America, Europe, or in the United Kingdom. But there's virtually no evidence or research on this phenomena in the global south and how women are experiencing it in the global south. And that's actually... Uh, something that we've started to um, rectify. We have an important line of research. We've been working with actually with CG in the University of, uh, of Waterloo, uh, WASMA, on, uh, on a global survey looking across 19 countries to try and get a bit of a handle or a, a wider understanding on the level and different types of online uh, violence that women um, are experiencing. And that's gonna be a really important first step. Um, something else that I also wanted to mention is um, 
This year, IDRC has been collaborating together with Global Affairs, and we've actually just, um, we have a call out right now for a research award uh, for women peace builders. And we're actually going to be giving out one of those over the next five years to look at specific WPS related issues uh, that require more Southern evidence. So I'm happy to give that information to Zoe. Um, but that also comes together with uh, the Women Leadership Awards that uh, Global Affairs is also launching. And so I think this is just so important for really bringing much better data and evidence um, on some of the things that are in the WPS uh, agenda. And then the other thing that I would want to circle back to, which I think is important, and there's a role for research and data on this as well, Zoe, although it's a much harder one to get a handle on. And this is, you know, we have to get much better global governance of technology. And it's a really slippery one to work on because it's not just working with states or governments or civil society organizations. We're actually working with private sector and industry. And, you know, I think we, it's become increasingly clear as we see um, hate speech. Uh, we only need to look at the events uh, in the United States at the beginning of January to have a really clear cut uh, idea of the role that technology uh, can play um, in violence. Um, and so this really does um, leak out into the gender sphere. And so I think there's important things. And I, and with this, I'll sort of uh, maybe give the floor back to you, Zoe, but I think that, um, you know, um, Wasma made a really important point around, you know, we need, we don't just need aid, we actually, we need leadership, we need diplomatic solutions, we need across government solutions of the type that Beth also mentioned uh, in her remarks. And I mean, I think it's, these are baby steps, but I think soft law and moving towards global governance on important things like technology. You know, we had in the G7 summit um, in 2018, the Charlevoix commitment to end sexual gender-based violence and harassment in digital contexts. You know, that's a first step. Um, if we remember WPS sort of started out as a very sort of soft law instrument and really gained momentum. So we have to keep plugging away at it, especially in these new areas, which are bringing us into, for many of us, unknown, um, uncomfortable territory um, around women, peace and security, but it's, it's the world we're in and it's changing fast. And so I think we really need to um, change with it. Thank you so much, Colleen, for these um, encouraging words, let's say, because of course uh, this topic, yes, started as a, let's say like a, a, a marginalized issue on the side of other topics and it's gained prominence, but there is still a long way to go um, as with other topics in peace building, to be honest. So I think it's not, um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a work that is over a long period, let's say, so we have to keep at it. Um, I was going to ask Beth a, a question, and it's also um, in the, the Q&A, so a few participants have asked this question. So, um, Beth, we are told a lot by the media and the government that we have a feminist foreign policy in Canada. So, um, could you unpack this a little bit for us? What does it mean? Do we really have a feminist foreign policy? Um, and, and what does it mean in terms of what we actually do around the world. So in the Q&A, we have people asking about uh, disarmament issue, other security issues, um, and, and aspects of how our military is, is also uh, dealing with, with this topic. It's a really good question, Zoe. And I think it's, it's one that doesn't have an easy answer to, and actually brings together a whole number of the threads in this discussion. Um, there's no globally agreed definition of what a feminist foreign policy is, just as that you can have many different definition of definitions of feminism and people, some people emphasize some elements and other people will emphasize other elements. One of the exciting things that this government has committed to, to do is to release a paper on how it understands 
um, uh, feminist foreign policy can be operationalized and what the different commitments are that it is making. We've been told so far that Canada's feminist foreign policy has different components of which the Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan is one of the pillars of, of Canada's current feminist foreign policy. So we're really looking forward to the release of this paper and Minister Garneau has promised that it will be sometime this spring. In preparation for this paper, the Global Affairs Canada opened up consultations last fall, and we formed a group, a number of, of civil society organizations in Canada. We called ourselves the Feminist Foreign Policy Working Group, and we co coordinated a number of consultations involving Canadians, involving academics, involving women human rights defenders from different parts of the world, involving people who had thought about uh, feminist foreign policy from different perspectives. The Global Affairs also ran their own consultations, uh, look, um, calling on, on different missions to reach out locally to see what uh, people had to say uh, about a feminist foreign policy. I'm not sure what the government paper is going to look like, but what I can offer you are some of the asks, some of the principles that came up in our consultations. We're hoping that Canada's feminist foreign policy will be transformational. This was a really important element that people raised and, and relates to what Wasma was, was saying and relates to some of the challenges Jackie's thrown out around bringing um, an anti-racism uh, perspective. What does this look like in a foreign policy? It also raises some of the questions um, Colleen has been asking about what does this mean in local contexts and how do we bring this perspective to new issues like cybersecurity? One of the major asks is that not just to bring women into existing structures and definitions, that when you change who sits around the table, you change the table. And that's really required for us to build global solutions in this moment. So if we're going to address climate change, if we're going to address the massive arms trade, if we're going to address the threat of nuclear weapons, we need new solutions. We need new understandings of what, what makes us secure. And so this is, is hopefully one of the elements in a feminist foreign policy that it's transformational. And it really, really listens to the kinds of voices that Wasma was talking about, that Colleen was talking about through, through local knowledge. The other piece of a feminist foreign policy, hopefully it will really bring, we're hearing more and more, the term intersectional, right? That bring all these different um, elements of, 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 of power, of different voices, so that we, we don't resort to an old fashioned binary of, well, we have men and we have women, and that's the way we understand the world. We're calling for a much, much more sophisticated analysis that, that re, um, reinvigorates this notion of gender that brings in the rights and perspectives of LGBTQ people that doesn't see the world just in terms of, of, of this binary, that brings in um, questions about how masculinity and security come together and how those can actually be drivers of, of conflict. There's, um, we've seen with the, with the far right, we've seen with the incel movement, we've seen these notions of how masculinity can be a, um, a source of, 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 of violence, certain forms of masculinity. So to bring in those notions into our analysis as well. Um, and one of the other elements in a feminist form policy that people identified during the consultations that they hope to see was that it um, there's a policy coherence to it, that it's applied inside of Canada as well as outside. So the issue that Jackie was talking about in terms of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but also other issues related to the role of, of uh, women in our security forces, um, the role of how we uh, LGBTQ people in security forces. Uh, so international and domestic, as well as across um, all the different 
different foreign policy levers. So trade, um, what does a gender perspective um, bring to, to trade discussions? Um, so actually, when you ask what are we expecting in the next national action plan, I think the, it's a real challenge because there are very, very high expectations, both for the range of issues that it's that that we're hoping this will cover, um, but also the sophistication of the analysis, the diversity of voices that we're hoping to see recognized. And then how does that, how does all that analysis, all those questions, how do they get translated into day-to-day -day actions by our diplomats, by our aid workers, by our armed forces, by our, 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 our trade counselors and the trade missions that we send. So it's not just that it's, an, it's a, um, a, a theoretical exercise, but what does it mean for foreign policy writ large in a, in a daily sense and how it's practiced and how Canada shows up uh, on the world stage um, in, in so many different levels from international organizations to how the, our, our um, High Commission interacts with women human rights defenders and women peace builders in specific countries. So big, big, um, very, very ambitious, but I think also very, very important questions that we should be wrestling with going forward. Thank you, Beth. Yes, I think there, there is a lot of topics that are emerging um, and, and many of them have been highlighted tonight. Um, we do have maybe this uh, feminist foreign policy paper coming out. We have the national action plan uh, review, mid, mid to end uh, review <laughs> uh, that is also coming up. And, and I assume that the government will start consulting on the next uh, national action plan in the next year. So um, I would like to throw the last question because we are almost running out of time to Ambassador Jackie to see, and this is maybe like a trick question, but like how does this all come together uh, in terms of how are we going to, let's say, reconcile all these new topics, these important topics and all these documents and how is this going to translate into like a perfect next national action plan? Yeah, no expectations at, at all there. Um, you know, as, as Beth mentioned, we want to be ambitious and it's really hard when you have high expectations, but that's what we need. Um, how it's all going to come together, we'll just we'll just keep trying. I mean, the, the key thing that I've taken away from this year and the last little while is, especially as it relates to global women, peace and security implementation, like we're not lacking the bold idea that's going to change everything. We need to do the hard work of implementing at the day-to-day -day level. And, and like, even when I started this, this job and I was engaging with a lot of um, stakeholders, so people within government, civil society here and internationally, people were, were pretty clear with me, at least at that time, that we didn't need another broad policy statement on women, peace, and security, that even the national action plan we had could be interpreted broadly enough uh, to really encompass what it needs to encompass. And we have to get a lot more specific about how this relates and, and what, what we're expecting of people and then holding them accountable to actually implementing it. I think so much of women, peace and security to date has really been an aspirational type of agenda. Even security council resolutions that you, know, you should, parties are called upon, um, but we're not seeing a lot of accountability. So, you know, how it will all come together. I hope that the, the feminist foreign policy articulation will identify and, or, and really be explicit as best referenced on the way that many points tie together, including security and the relationship of security to trade, uh, to defense, to, to other, um, other areas that, in which Canada's involved. And I think we got to just keep focusing on listening to communities most affected and then building solutions that our, uh, you know, within government that we continue to implement. The last thing I'd say, is, and I always feel the need to plug this, is that this is a political agenda. And so we need people to engage with their members of parliament, with politicians, with political parties in Canada and tell them what you want from Canada. Uh, there's really only so much that we can do within a department without political lead in, leadership and guidance. And, and uh, it's really, really important that politicians hear from Canadians about what you want in our foreign policy. And I think... In many ways, the term feminist foreign policy is both wonderful and groundbreaking and it conveys really important things. And it's a highly charged and sometimes problematic term that turns a lot of people off at the outset. 
And so, you know, if you want even the principles of it to be applied in the way that we engage in the world, tell your members of parliament that because they need to hear it in order to continue this, this push forward. How's that for punting that to our, our parliament for that last area? No, thank you. I think this is a very good reminder that, of course, this is a, in, implemented by government, but it is a political agenda. And so um, in terms of the willpower of the, the, you know, the political will, let's say, to push this forward has to also come from uh, our elected representative and the citizens of Canada. So yeah, and um, progress is never guaranteed, right? That, if that's anything we've taken away from this year, it's not linear. And there's all kinds of risks where it can be deprioritized. It can these things can fall off the radar of attention and, and we got to keep it on the on the front burners uh, for everybody in, in this universe, this kind of ecosystem that we all work in, because it really is vulnerable, more vulnerable than it seems, I think. And, yes, and perhaps and I think, we, yep. so, no, and perhaps ahead, one Beth. of the challenges with, with COVID that's both a challenge and an opportunity is that there is a tendency perhaps to turn inward because we close our borders to protect uh, to to keep the virus out but we're also very very aware of our global vulnerability and that the the that i think there is this opening now for us to relook at how we are connected what makes us secure what kind of investments will really bring security for for canadians and how that actually fits with our understanding of power of our understanding of whose voices are relevant and what kinds of solutions we the world needs today and Canada's role within that and how that relates to traditional Canadian values of equality so it's it's a challenge but hopefully it's also an opportunity for us to 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 relook at some of these issues sorry about that sorry but just thought I'd throw no, that no, in. no exactly and and I was just going to point out also that um, some of these topics in Canada and as around the world have been also pushed by civil society um, very much, um, including the creation of uh, the position of Women, Peace and Security Ambassador. Uh, so I think this is also, a, a, let's so say, I don't want to call it a struggle, but a struggle that continues. Uh, I, and I want to just uh, testify to what Beth is also saying that looking inwards, having worked with a female ambassador from Canada and worked uh, working with other ambassadors of Canada, I've seen how much you know they were able to actually bring that feminist foreign policy, their understanding of women's leadership into the work, which was a huge difference between the way a man worked um, as, a, as, a, as an ambassador. So it's also about inward and how it if reflects you know their attitude outside and their working ways with other countries yeah, but we need to to keep at it let's say to maintain this level of engagement and so that's a very good reminder for all of us so um i apologize for to our participants that may have asked questions in the chat that we didn't have time to uh to go to i will use my power as a moderator to maybe ask our four panelists to join us again at a later date um, where we can discuss more because I think there's a number of topics that we only um, brush through and, and there would be more questions uh, from myself for sure and I'm sure from the audience to go a bit deeper. So we may want to reconvene in a few months when there is the, the feminist uh, foreign policy is out and maybe when we have some kind of review of the current implementation of the national action plan um, so I'm left with the task to conclude. So I want to thank very much all of you because this was a really, really interesting discussion. Um, I would like to highlight to all our participants that if, they, if you haven't read all of our speakers' uh, biographies, please do so because you will see the level of experience that they are bringing to this discussion, which really reflected in the, uh, the discussion itself and the, the depth um, of what people had to say. So uh, I hope that it was enjoyable for everyone. It was definitely very enjoyable for me. So I hope we can reconvene again. Um, we will, uh, we have been recording this uh, webinar, so it will be on YouTube at some point. And we will share um, the link with all of the participants that have registered as well as with different networks. So if someone has missed the discussion or wants to see part of it again, this will be available. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, and then uh, I will wish you a good night and hope to see you in our next discussion. Thanks so much, Zoe. Thanks, Zoe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.